Hi, and welcome. Andres, are you, are you sure you don't need more time? I mean, seriously. Um, I'm going to talk about the madness of wisdom today. Um, thank you, Cortez. That was really an exceptionally motivating set of thoughts there. Actually, I don't have any time to ramble. Shit, the time's running down as I speak. Um, I'm going to actually, this is kind of a bit about what um, Julian said this morning. Um, and I'm going to be touching on intuitive thought, creativity, in fact, reasons of which reason know nothing. But first, if this works, I'm going to show you very quickly. I've got two minutes. I've timed this to the second. So um, I'm going to show you a few pieces of work that we do. Um, we have a studio in London, Paris, Berlin, Barcelona, and in New York at the moment. And we're applying connected, joined up thinking across everything. As Andres said, we're working for the Times in London, which my mother was really happy about. Um, and now we're working for the BBC, so she's told all my neighbors. Kenzo won. This is the American campaign to help eliminate poverty that extraordinarily has now got over three million signatures in North America. There's hope yet. Um, a lot of the work of the studio is obsessed with language and our loss of identity through language. And what happens to language when you move beyond words? Um, ultimately, this led me to an exhibition in Moscow, amongst other things. Um, one of my biggest influences that is squashing this. It's quite interesting. Sorry, guys. Um, this is a poster which the screen is expanding into a a square. Um, this is a mural we did for an, an arts institute in the UK. Um, magazines, I do a lot of magazine work together with newspapers. This is a cover for GQ in Italy. A lot of typographic experimentation. This is one of my fonts. Um, each character here represents a different letter of the alphabet. So the alphabet is basically a contract. It's an agreement between two parties that certain shapes represent certain things. And when we put them into an order, it means something. This is a contract. As part of this experimentation, we work on a magazine called Fuse. Fuse, which hopefully we'll bring to Mexico in the next year or two, maybe with Andres as a conference. Fuse is about looking at the way our ideas are locked up in language and how can we liberate ourselves by collapsing language and seeing what else can come from it. A lot of the work we do is very tactile. I think part of our digital lessons is to get back to something we can touch. And a current obsession of mine, which we'll come back to, is free me from freedom. We sacrificed our freedoms for protection this is an exhibition I recently did in London where we had 400 cameras focused on the visitor to represent how many times you will appear on camera in the streets of London every day if you are out. This is the result of those 400 images. Another obsession of ours is to do with data surveillance, the shadows we leave in that invisible space. I wanted today to talk about potential, because as this conference is about ideas, I thought I would focus today on this single word. I think thinking is not enough. Awareness is not enough in itself. The question is simple. How do we apply our minds to address the real needs of the world today? through real action, how can we convert these thoughts into actual objects and tangible plans? As thinkers and as businessmen and leaders and as students here, we have just one client, which is actually the rest of mankind. And truly right now, we stand at the brink of an amazing time in human history, which is that of an extraordinary flowering of the human mind. Um, I think we're on the tip, I would say, of a new renaissance. 
a dynamic and accessible existence of vital culture which we can create in a new world of joined up thinking. So what now? Well, to achieve a joined up world, we have to move a lot of things. See, a joined up world is capable of absolutely anything. A joined up world is capable of curing AIDS. It's capable of eliminating malaria. These are easy things of ensuring that every single being on the world receives, in the world receives an education. We can ensure that poverty is eradicated forever. And we can guarantee that every single person on this planet not only has a voice, but also has a say. So a joined up world might protect the planet. It might even prevent war. Or it might ensure health care for every single person. So why don't we have that? There's a lot of reasons. Our energy is locked up. It's locked up in spaces which we don't even know exist. We need to liberate ourselves. We need to unblock the arteries that have become narrowed through copyright ownership. Copyright is constricting our activities. And thirdly, we have to face the fear that we allow to rule us. We went from learning to earning in this last 25 years, and now we're moving to a space of yearning. We've forgotten why we are here. We've forgotten what we're supposed to be doing. We've lost touch, I think, with what made us tick, what motivated us, what the fire of creative possibility is that once consumed us. See, revolutionary thought, I kind of come from a revolutionary generation in some ways. Revolutionary thought is now a distant memory. I grew up as part of a generation that thought that what we were doing for the world actually was to help the world. A forgotten word, progress. We can help improve things, we can help be conscious and to help spread that consciousness through a kind of creative awareness. We can bring exploration, observation and questioning. See, about 1984, the idea of helping became money. Um, certainly in the West, Reagan and Thatcher replaced culture with money. They said that thinkers should become earners, creators should become entertainers, thoughts should become commodities, and a whole dumbed-down generation was born. This generation feels largely entitled to success and profit without having to really think or work too much. But you see, we've now with the collapse of the banks, being left with a spiritual hollowness, a spiritual emptiness. We don't know what to believe anymore. The belief systems of consumption and commodity have been exposed as empty. Revolution is a distant echo. We can't turn back to revolution. And religion has been largely subsumed by globalization. It's not relevant. Virtual experiences have replaced the human touch. And analog or physical culture is now fairly exotic. And the reality is, is, sorry, the reality is that we've, I think, managed to create, for the first time in history, potentially, a future for our children which is less hopeful than the one we have today. And that's an extraordinary legacy. See, what happened is we've been through a 25-year deep freeze, quarter of a century of locked up ideas and potential. We somehow denied ourselves permission to remember what it was like before the Big Bang, that time when banks became deregulated. Schools in that time became businesses. Hospitals became profit centers. Art was no longer for art's sake and was sacrificed for putting bums on seats. Ideas became cliches and anything different was viewed with suspicion and disdain. See, as the Lehman Brothers collapsed, the bank. So a new era, a new era was signaled. And the baton is being passed on again. Now we have the opportunity, an extraordinary opportunity, to reclaim the cultural high ground, to take it away from the idea that culture is money. And we can really risk doing something new. A creative breach in the barrier would let creative light shine through the cracks. 
The line of dangerous ideas that we were on has been interrupted. We've forgotten where that line was. We need to find that path. We need to get back to madness. When was the last time, really, anyone here encountered a culture or an idea that you could really say was dangerous, that actually challenged anything you really believed? So we've given it up for what I call the three Gs, greed, generics, and guns. We've allowed big business to get bigger. We've allowed business to own our planet, and we've paid with our freedoms. We've forgotten the right words. We've forgotten the words which motivated us. We've forgotten equality, progress, revolution, peace, access, uprising, opportunity, democracy, and freedom. We've forgotten what these words really mean, and we've forgotten how to make things with our hands. We yearn that human touch. We yearn the touch of clay, or the touch of a human instrument, or the touch of the other people. And we failed to live up to the promise that we made to our own children, which is that learning should be for everyone. Everyone should be entitled. We sacrificed our culture for money, our individualism for genericism. Um, what was once a solo thought is now part of a mass brand. And we've given up our freedoms for protection. That's a big sacrifice. We traded our freedom for peace. And what we really need today is liberation. We all signed up for this. We all signed up for freedom. But what does it really mean? But you see, now we have an absolutely unbelievable opportunity. If we can give ourselves permission at the end of this 25 years to really release new ideas, embrace chaos, explore newness, and celebrate difference, an unbelievable future awaits us and our children. See, the goal and challenge is how to achieve oneness as a human race and simultaneously protect individual DNA. In the busy world that we live in, the demands of communication often outstrip the benefits, and we become hubs, like an airport, a state where a hundred wires and conduits are plugged into us, and we have little time in the day to process this constant flow of messages and information. All we can do is simply pass it on. All this busyness keeps us from having to think. We're too busy to really think about what we're doing. We don't take time out. And we become increasingly defined who we are by our input and output. And in this world of cloning, of generic culture, this planet of the apes, we sacrificed our cultural individuality for membership. We signed up to a kind of corporate empire where small differences are paraded as major benefits, where cities begin to look exactly the same the world over, and where languages meld and dissolve through mass entertainment. Our aspirations become common, not in the sense of exceptional, but as in the sense of ordinary. We've been committing cultural genocide for decades, and this process has been accelerated as the tools for control in the battle for our minds have improved hugely in their efficiency. Our very DNA has been subverted. We've ended up with, with a grid where the control of many through pattern making and familiarity is for the benefit of the few. You see, with greater bandwidth comes narrower choice. See, money itself doesn't exist. Like language, it's just a concept. It's a belief system. I mean, money, okay, might be physical, but these days it's numbers, it's digits, and it's a belief. If we don't all hold the belief, the money idea collapses as language. So if this is so, if language is, and money is just a belief, then why can't we come up with a better currency, a better idea for currency? Maybe it's a currency based on real ideas, or creative thoughts, or good deeds. I know this is very 
utopian, but I think if we don't dream, then we can't move forward. If we, continue to, if we continue to subvert our culture to money, then why can we not ensure that everyone has, as money is just an idea, why can we not ensure that everyone has, at the very minimum, a little of it? Survival is our mutual obligation and our destiny. See, the real revolutionary thought here, actually, is that we have to abandon copyright. At its most fundamental level, we are complicit. We allow a few individuals to own all of the ideas. A single color or a single word, a drug formula or a face or a piece of music. We need to find a way of unclogging these creative arteries. They are constricting our blood supply. We need to find other ways of sponsoring culture, performance, maybe by government or by subscription or by common consensus. We must find a way to allow drug companies to serve those who cannot pay. We have to begin a process wherein religion serves us through mutual respect and inclusion. So amazingly, the pipelines are now well into being laid for a new joined up world. We're doing many things right. In Africa, we're building a cellcoms network that enables an economic revolution through mobile banking, a micro level macro trade. Why can we not use the same tools to extend education? The space we're heading towards is a space where every single thing ever recorded by mankind will be available to every single person on this planet at any time from anywhere. And that's an extraordinary thought. And that's the exact reality we're heading into. It's a huge thought. It's a revolution in itself. And we're building essentially what I call a neural network, where every single person on this planet will be more and more connected to every other single person on this planet. This is happening now. We need to understand this. We need to understand what this means to society. This is potentially the biggest revolution in our culture, certainly since the Industrial Revolution, if not a long time before. The neural network is like a large brain with a constantly active consciousness and memory. Our culture will be always on. Our choice will be to say yes or no. The only choices we'll have left, in a way, will be to turn the machine off. But this will generate new artists. The new artists will plan journeys through this space. The result will be a journal. So the Orson Welles or the Da Vinci or the Francis Bacon or the historian will learn several different skills. They'll learn video, audio, research, marketing, interactive, development, politics, all of these skill sets will allow new kinds of journeys. And everyone visiting that journey will add a journey to that journey. And so in the end, you will have a series of well-worn uh, well paths through the forest of information. See, difference for the last 25 years has been the enemy. A controlling culture and a controlling corporate culture and a controlling governmental culture are only interested in familiarity, similarity, and patterns. We no longer allow ourselves the risk of allowing something to just happen, an accident, to risk the unknown, to experience something maybe unpredictable. Personality itself is seen as imperfection. Madness, as Clotaire said, is seen as undesirable. I'd rather be an undesirable. But the reality is, we live in a world that's so full of love that we no longer know how to find it. And it's so full of the human spirit that we've had to, to apply several layers of paint to cover it up. And we live in a world with such potential positivity that we choose to live in the negative. If war is all there is, what is it good for? We've forgotten that we can really break the rules. Why not? We have to remember how to embrace chaos. Evolution doesn't come from pattern. Pattern is death. 
Chaos is about growth. We have to remember how to trust ourselves in that. We have to commit fully also to the idea that other cultures are as valid as ours and they can be respected and learned from. You see, we seem to be stuck in a place of fear right now. We fear that we won't survive. We fear that we'll lose our jobs. We fear that we won't make a profit or that someone will attack us for no reason other than that they disagree with us. We fear to be different. We fear to criticize our own governments or their actions. We fear failure and we fear fear. Our governments and corporations use fear to control us. We're being watched right now, actually, on Mexican TV. Thank you, Andres. But everything we do, everything we do, everywhere we go, and every action we take is recorded. And this low-level anxiety that we live in is exhausting. And we're afraid to raise our voices. But raise our voices, we must. We owe it to ourselves and the society we serve to tear up the, the rules, tear up the plans, try something new, try something mad. We have to embrace risk and danger, thoughts beyond the normal palette of thought. We have to embrace the technology that allows our messages to actually be changed by the receiver. We have to embrace an alternative to the Hollywood, the AOL, Time Warner, Disneyization of our lives. And we're in a, an amazing position right now. We're on the brink of the most amazing, fantastic era in history. We move from engineering to human software. We know how to build the solutions. We can do many things. We can create independent channels for independent ideas and culture. We can think about education instead of dictation. We can allow access to people and allow the actual message itself to be changed. We can add such flexibility in our languages that they are ownable at local level. We can bring simplicity and creative exuberance. We can talk to each other, we can share ideas, and we can be humans talking to other humans. In other words, we can use other words. We can talk about our love for our fellow man, of opportunity, of learning. We can empower the individual, we can break the cycle. We could start somewhere with a simple idea that could be no more poverty. And we have to bring new and real meaning to the, th the phrase, think different. And let's see what difference we can really make. To answer the question at the beginning of this talk, which is what now? All I can say is I don't know. But if we don't tear up the plans, we will never find out. Thank you.